Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get started now. Um, welcome everybody. My name's Steve Farrar, and absent a library assistant, I get to introduce myself. Um, we're we're going on the first of our our park tours today. If you what we've got set up as a series every other week that if you keep tuning in, you'll you'll end up with essentially virtual tours to all of the national parks. We're gonna we're gonna start on the East Coast. A um, couple housekeeping notices. Um, it's important to note that I am not a an employee of the National Park Service. Um, in my considered opinion, they should be throwing me a little something because I'm generating a lot of in interest in visiting our parks, but that's neither here nor there. Um, okay, I'm not sure if I have a, a microphone. I will try to project a little more, but you can sit closer if you'd like. Um, By saying I'm not a, a NPS employee, if they do a good job, I'm I'm very willing to give them the, the tip of the hat and, and credit them for it. On the flip side, if in fact I feel there's a little shortcoming on their part, I'm free to point that out as well <laughs> without fear of repercussions. Um, one thing about pictures, if I'm in the pictures or if my kids are in the pictures, they're mine. I started back in the 60s visiting national parks. You don't want to see my Kodak Instamatic uh, images from the grainy uh, blown up to a high resolution image. They're rough. So some of the play, some of the images I've downloaded comparable better resolution pictures from the National Park Service sites or something. Um, each of the places I've been to, but some of the uh, pictures were not taken physically by me. Takes about an hour to go through the parks. I've, I've divided them up as your handout shows. Um, you can only do seven or eight parks in, in an hour to do any kind of justice to covering the parks. Um, if you have questions of something that's right on the screen and you're in attendance, Feel free, raise your hand, glad to go over you know, and clarify. If you're on Zoom and you have a question, feel free to type in chat. Joe is uh, monitoring that and we'll get to them at the end. I'll, I'll stay as long as you have questions at the end. But uh, if we go down side trails, it's, it's gonna take considerably more than, than the hour. Um, the show is being recorded. So if, if you'd like, or if you wanna share that with somebody, you can go to the Osterville Village Library website for upwards of four weeks afterwards to see it again or review or mention it to someone else. So without further ado, this is our, our trip for today. We're going to start up in Maine, and we'll end up all the way down in the Everglades at the southern tip of Florida. Normally, when, when you... Uh, conjure up images of national parks, your, your knee-jerk reaction is to think of the, the big Western parks, the, the Grand Canyon or the thermal areas of uh, Yellowstone or Yosemite. These are drivable. These are, these are day, eh, maybe couple day trips, long weekend trips. You can, you can get to the East Coast. We do have one national park here in New England, Acadia. Map shows down down east up on the coast. It's actually from the late 1600s. Uh, the French explorer Champlain he named the island that he saw from from the coast. They're bare granite tops, so he called it the island of barren mountains. There was no soil. There were no vegetation. There were no trees on top. They were just bare bare granite. So he called them in French, Mont Desert. Um, that's how Mount, Mount Desert Isle got its name. Most of the, actually more than half of our national parks got their starts initially as national monuments. And then 
because they got popular or needed expansion, they get kicked upstairs, they get promoted to actual national park status. That was two weeks ago, we went through the different unit designations under the Park Service. Um, Sur de Man of the Mountains National Monument. Three years later, now if you happen to be on Jeopardy, you might want to remember this, we had a Lafayette National Park. Um, that's what Acadia was initially called for 10 years. And then in 1929, there was a name change to Acadia. So if somebody mentions Lafayette National Park, that's what they're making reference to. So now we've got Acadia. Very, very first US soil to see the rays of the, the new day each day, sunrise. It's, this is an image of sunrise from the top of Cadillac Mountain. If you're from Colorado and you're used to 14,000 footers calling Cadillac Mountain a mountain, <laughs> you might snicker at. It's 1,500 feet tall, 1,530, which doesn't sound like a lot, but from Newfoundland in Canada, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego at the bottom of South America, along the entire Atlantic seaboard, this is the highest point anywhere along there. So 1530 isn't much, but it's uh, relative to others, it's a high point. You've got Bar Harbor tucked over in the corner, visible from the top. Very noteworthy is the fact that you get winds off the water that keeps it cool. It doesn't get up to 100 degrees up there. It's very enjoyable climate in the summer. And conversely, in the, in the wintertime, it's the Gulf Stream. So Maine can get pretty brutal inland Maine, but not along the coast. The, so it's cool in the summer, relatively warm in the winter. What that did was attract those with the means to say, Hey, maybe if you live in Philadelphia or down in Manhattan, August, you don't want to be down there. It gets a little untenable. They had cottages at, at Newport, but always looking for a new place. The 1890s caught fire and this became the new hip place. Those with means, well, Morgans, Astors, Rockefellers, Carnegie's built their cottages which is what they refer to them as, um, maybe six weeks a year, somebody lived there and that was it. That was fine for a while, but 1947 was absolutely the driest year on record. After Memorial Day, not a drop of rain all through the summer. The island was tinder dry. A fire started and it took a full month before it got put out. It burned almost a third of the island to the ground. 67 of those cottages along Millionaire Row got burned down and were, most of them were never rebuilt again. So that changed the complexion of things. A bar harbor is either blessed with or cursed by, whichever side of the coin you want to look at, a deep harbor port. What that does is allow the big cruise ships to list Bar Harbor as a port of call. If you're going to Acadia, you might want to check the cruise line schedule. If you've been on cruises, you know how many people pour off of those boats in their two hours or three hours of shore time. All of a sudden, it's not so easy to get a cafe spot in, in Bar Harbor, or more importantly, if you want to tour the park loop, the, the taxis get gobbled up in a hurry. So it's something to take into account. The Park Loop Road that, that circumnavigates a, the east side of the park is about 20 miles. The little squiggle there in the middle of the loop is the seven mile. You, you don't even have to hike to get up to the 1500 foot summit of Cadillac Mountain. You can drive right to the top. Most of the coves a lot of the island is accessible by trails. You can either walk down. There's one singular beach on the entire island that has sand. All of the rest of it is your classic main coastal waves smashing against granite. Um, that's the typical 
coastline there. You can take paths there. You can ride bikes around. You can sit on the granite, but there's, like I say, there's not a lot of uh, sunbathing going on. Thunder Hole is a, is a common popular spot. It does make a loud noise when the waves come into the sluice there. Just a, an added warning, if you have cameras or, or any electronic cell phones, you might want to put them in a baggie because you, anybody standing down there when the waves come in gets soaked. Um, they don't want to ruin stuff. You're going to hear the, the name John Rockefeller Jr. quite a bit during my talks. Um, we owe a serious tip of the cap to, to him in terms of the assistance that he lent to the Park Service. He owned a lot of land on the island. And back in the 30s, when motor cars were coming into vogue, he was aghast at the concept of these gas-guzzling, stinky, noisy machines ruining his paradise island. So he built a carriage road. He and his dad built a 57-mile carriage road. When John Jr. does something, he doesn't do it halfway. It's a broken stone road. This is the finest example you'll find anywhere in North America of a broken stone road. The, the Romans invented that. It's a means, it's, it's why you can go 2000 years after the Appian Way was built and walk on the Appian Way. When you build it right, it lasts. That's the kind of road that he put in here, the carriage road. Instead of guardrails, he puts the granite blocks on the sides. That's his signature of a, of a road that he, John Jr., builds. They became known as Rockefeller's Teeth. Um, it's kind of his signature. So you can still go. Uh, there's horse-drawn carriage rides. You can ride your bike there. You can walk the path. You can, um, no motor vehicles allowed, however. One of the favored stops along the way is the Jordan Pond House. Not sure I would want to be a slate roofer working on that pitch. Um, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty steep. You'd be hard pressed to find a more traditional Yankee way to spend an afternoon than afternoon tea on the back lawn at Jordan. It's sitting in an Adirondack chair. What they serve are hot, hot popovers, locally sourced strawberry jam, fresh squeezed lemonade. It, it's absolutely in the to die for category, in my opinion. It's, it's just a, a wondrous way to spend an afternoon. Very memorable. And that's your view of Jordan Pond. You have the bubbles off in the, in the distance there. The uh, mountains, the hills. So you can ride your bike along. And if you travel along the carriage road, you get good scenery. But... There are 17 places along the route where the road either had to clear a dip, uh, a dell of some sort, or clear a stream or whatever. John Rockefeller Jr. gave complete creative license to 17 individual masons and said, build me a bridge. We got to get over this spot. It's a very cool bucket list to to go and visit the, the different handcrafted bridges along the route. They're all different. They're all magnificent. My personal favorite is the cobblestone. I mean, they just don't build bridges like that anymore. Look at the, look at the underside of the inlaid cobblestones in there stuff. Problem is if you're just driving along the carriage road, you don't, un, you don't appreciate what you're going over. You have to get off the road and go out in the woods to look back at the bridges. So it's, in my opinion, not to be missed. It's, it adds quite a bit to your uh, enjoyment of the carriage road. So the hemlock bridge, not only frames in the shape of a hemlock, you're looking through at hemlocks and stuff. So they're, they're very fun. Park Loop does drive, you drive under the carriage road at a couple places. I won't go into too much geology here, but it, again, my opinion, 
you can you can go to any of the national park. You can stand on the edge of the Grand Canyon and it, your draw will drop. It's a magnificent sight. Or Inspiration Point, looking at at uh, Yosemite Valley. However, if you do a little homework and you learn a little about the geology of what formed what you're looking at, my opinion, it adds considerably to an appreciation of what you're seeing. Briefly, the granite domes in Acadia are basically million-year-old cousins of the granite domes in Yosemite. They were formed the same way. It's, it's basically a hot air balloon five to six miles down filled with lava that because of the clash of tectonic plates get forced up. But they're forced up very slowly, so the granite chill, uh, the, the lava cools slowly, that forms the granite, and eventually they pop up above the ground. That's what you're looking at. They've been there for so long that any soil that's eroded is off of it. That's why they have the bare granite domes. Very similar process formed uh, Yosemite. The signature trail, if you're gonna, if you want to notch on your belt, is to say that you climb the precipice trail in Acadia. A thousand foot elevation gain in in only a mile. It's fairly steep. There are some uh, sheer drops that you're going along. They give you some iron rungs to help scramble up in in places. They give you handholds because off to the right there, it, it's it's rather a steep drop off. But if you uh, aren't afraid of heights and you go up to the top, your reward is it's a beautiful view from, from the summit. The mini-me version of Precipice Trail is the Beehive. Beehive's 500 feet instead of 1,000. So it's a little more attainable, but that's the trail. Straight up the face of, of this thing. <laughs> so that's negotiating the handhold. There, there's blue blazes painted on the granite that shows you where you're supposed to be going. Um, there's my son, one of I have three boys. This is my middle son, Jake. They they give you a help to get around the corner that's a little tricky there. They put a, an iron ladder in place. But your reward, that that's the <laughs> that's the trail. You can see the blue blaze there. Uh, yeah, you're going in the right place. It's straight up. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun, fun hike, climb. But your reward, they're not very creative. The one sandy beach in Acadia is called Sand Beach. <laughs> but you get a good view. You're, you're towering right up above it from the top of the beehive. So that's that's a, a November picture of Sand Beach without the sunbathers crowding it. And that's the beehive over to the right there. Some sound. Some sound is, is on Mount Desert Isle, Island. It was gouged out by the retreating glaciers in the last ice age. So it's an entrance from seawater in normally referred to as a fjord, and for many years that was called the only fjord in the lower 48. Alaska has a bunch. But if you've been to Norway and you see the real fjords, they're very, very steep cliffs on the sides. That's a fjord. Geologists have a new term. It's not a misspelling. Some sound is a fjord. So if you don't have the steep sides, it's formed the same way. It's an inlet from the sea, gouged out by a glacier. But if you don't have the steep walls, it's called a fjord instead of a fjord. So see that? You learn something every day. A lot of the coves are accessible by trail. It's an island. They, don't, they can't access everything. So there are, they're not so much hidden coves. They just don't have ready access. So the way you get to those is you rent a sea kayak and you can paddle around. You've, you've probably heard of the overcrowding issues in our national parks. It's just a function of timing, either what time of year or what time of day you choose to, to go there. You can go see our parks and maybe not have them all to yourself, but avoid the crowds. 
little tricky coming ashore. They, you don't have the sand beaches to pull your, your, your kayak up on, but if you can land, you can have your lunch at a, at a cove where it's yours. You have a personal uh, place to stay. Another way to differentiate, or, or you can go back to the same park again and again, but if you go at a different time of year, the complexion totally changes. This is your view from the Jordan Pond backyard. When, when the foliage changes, you get a very, very different image. There's your carriage road. Autumn, you get a very different look to the place than you did in, in the summer or in the springtime. Even the, the small short grasses and, and scrub stuff up on the top of Cadillac Mountain change color. One of the most photographed lighthouses anywhere in the country is over on the west coast of Mount Desert, Mount Desert Island, um, Bass Harbor Light. Kind of hard to take a bad image of that place. I mean, everything you take is postcard material. It's beautiful. Or you can go back to Jordan Pond and get your sunset shot. Or you can go back up to the top of Cadillac and essentially turn 180 degrees from your sunrise shot and face west and get the same image sunset. So that's my pictorial image clue that we've finished with a park. I'll show you sunset pictures and then we move on to, to another park. But before we get to a national park, we do have a new national monument relatively new, it's five years old, um, it, up in Maine. Katahdin Wooden Waters, it's a national monument. President Obama used the Antiquities Act in 2016 to create it. <laughs> how, would you, how would you like to have a spare 87,000 acres that you didn't know what to do with? <laughs> Roxanne Quimby is the owner of Burt's Bees. She owned 87,000 acres that she didn't want the lumber company coming in and, and clear cutting. It's essentially adjacent to the northeast of Baxter State Park. Baxter is where Katahdin is. Katahdin, Mount Katahdin is the northern end of the Georgia to Maine Appalachian Trail. There's actually uh, an extension, a 35 mile extension of the Appalachian Trail called the International Appalachian Trail. It goes up from Katahdin to the Canadian border. And most of it goes through this, this new parcel, the new National Monument. Uh, going across the, the summit of Katahdin, there's a knife edge that you have to cross. We started down at uh, Chimney Pond there, came up from the right, and you have to cross over. That's my foot looking straight down the, the drop. If you turn around behind me, the other side is just as steep, which is why they call it knife edge. Uh, so it's not, not for the faint of heart to, to walk across that. Now the Penobscot River flows south. It bumps into Katahdin and splits into an east branch and a north and a west branch. The east branch is in the new National Monument, fairly mellow. The west branch, however, <laughs> has a dam on it, um, hydroelectric power source, there are a few times during the summer where they open the, the floodgates <laughs> and increase the, the flow of the water, which is great for whitewater rafting. Twice a year, they do what's called a turbine test, where not only do they open the gates, they crank up the turbines, the, the water level rises to seven times the normal flow. And it allows, this, this is during a turbine test. That's me in the green hat in the middle, my son Jake is tippy side in front of me. And my son Brooks is right smack up in the top on the left. He, he had the front left seat. So he got, uh, he got some white water in the face. Uh, normally you have to go around this rock. It's called Maytag and uh, the, you have to circumvent it. We actually went, didn't tip over. We went right almost dead vertical and, and up and over because of the increased flow. But if that's not your thing, if you want to chill, go over to the East Branch. It's uh, very mellow. So we'll move on to our next national park in Ohio, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Anybody over 50 years old here? <laughs> and in, 
in in my when I hear the word Cuyahoga and Cleveland in the same sentence, what the image that comes to mind to me is in 1969, the Cuyahoga River, which runs through downtown Cleveland, was so super polluted, it caught fire. It burned for a week before they could, the, the river caught fire and burned for a week. This was the 13th time that it caught fire. That's how badly polluted the Cuyahoga River was. Cuyahoga National Park started out as a national recreation area. The, the river flows north up to Lake Erie. It connects two urban areas, Akron to the south and Cleveland. People need a place to recreate, so they set a big park. It's under the National Park Service protection. It's conserved. Nobody's building condos there or anything. It was doing fine. The northernmost section there was 47 acres that glommed on in the eight, in 1985. That wasn't too much of a of a, an appreciated gift because it turned out to be the the Krejci Superfund dump site. It was so polluted they had to remove over 740 million pounds. I don't know how big a a mound that would make, but it took a lot to, to clear it out and make it happy. Anybody know what was going on in October of 2000? Very coincidentally, normally it takes an act of Congress to create a national park. You have to, normally the Department of the Secretary of the Interior would come before Congress and make a case for the proposed conserved area, maybe they'd bring in the, the director of the park service to give you the pluses and minuses about the area. They vote on it, the bill goes to the president and he signs it and you have a new national park. Well, just coincidentally, three weeks before the November 6, 2000 election, that was Gore and Bush, that was the hanging chads down. There were two swing states that were gonna be critical to that election, Ohio and Florida. At a time when there was not in anybody's best interest to stand up in Congress and suggest that, no, I don't agree that there's anything in Ohio worthy of national park status, a bill was introduced to upgrade the national recreation area to a national park. Nobody voiced any opposition. President Clinton signed it into being. We now have a new national park. It's a very unusual national park. That's the map of the park. Now I've actually, yep, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Do you currently have any uh, parks here at the same time? Um, that, that was actually, the question is, where did the toxic materials came from? That was up, up river, those industrial sites had been closed down, but that's what caused the river to be super polluted. And this was like a tributary where they, they congealed and gathered in the mud, I guess. The, the sources had been discontinued, but the pollutants had to be removed. I actually had the opportunity to talk to the director of the National Park at a, at a I met her down in Washington, DC. And I asked, could you tell me where the focal point, where the beating heart of Cuyahoga National Park is? If the director can't answer that question, <laughs> it, it, floats a question mark over your head. She couldn't tell me where the center of her, her own park was. There are, as you can see, there's interstates, there's state routes, there's roads, there's, you're between Akron and Cleveland. There are small towns inside the border of the park. Private attractions, um, and initially it was set aside to preserve the old Erie Canal, the root of the old Erie Canal that had barges up to Lake Erie. Well, the, there's no current. They, they needed to be towed by horses. So there's a towpath along the old path. This is the towpath and they run a marathon there. You can go ride your bikes and stuff along the old towpath. They built a railroad. You can take, sorry for the sarcasm, but you can take a railroad under the picturesque interstate highway. 
if you have kids, you can bring them to the national park on Saturday nights and Thomas the train shows up Saturday afternoons. If you don't have kids, you can go on Friday nights and ride the Ales on Rails. They have beer tasting railroad trips. This is in a national park. <laughs> not, not normally what you would go to visit in a national park for. If beer is not your thing, you can go to the vineyard. They have a winery, they have uh, tasting rooms, they have a retail store. Sarah's Vineyard is inside the park. You can get married there. You can <laughs> rent out the Happy Days Lodge for, for your wedding. There's a conference center with rooms upstairs and live music down below. Um, if you're having a family reunion and you don't want to get rained on, you can rent this place. The Octagon is available. I don't jump to mind as Ohio when I think skiing, but inside the, there's actually two ski areas inside the boundaries of the National Park. There's commercial ski areas. You, you get the picture. This isn't your normal National Park. I did find a field but it happened to be Wednesday and Wednesday is farmer's market day. So I had company, they had lots of tents there. You get a lot of fresh produce. Austin Visitor Center. They do have foliage. It's, it's about the same parallel as Connecticut or so. So the deciduous trees do change. However, you can't, uh, unless you're good at, at uh, Photoshopping, you can't get rid of the power towers in the background there. There's a, a hike you can do to get some rock up the ledges. There's a boardwalk that takes you out to Brandywine. As long as it's rained recently, you'll have some water flow there. Um, it does kind of dry up in July and August. You may not have much of a flow there. Um, boardwalks, marsh, they, they are making progress. However, it's not totally worthless. They, they finally, um, May of 2020, they removed this 200-year-old dam that used to inhibit water sports. You, you, you had to portage around this. Uh, for the first time in 200 years, you can now paddle the Cuyahoga from Akron, 37 miles all the way up to Cleveland. So water sports are becoming more popular there. And since they've cleaned up the pollutants, for the first time, fish are now the, the all the birds disappeared because they eat fish and if the fish die because it, the water's too polluted then there's no wildlife well now the fish have returned so they now have nesting pairs of not only great blue herons they have some bald eagles there and stuff so it is making a comeback they're they're trying I did <laughs> did find a spot to sit and watch sunset however if you pivot from the seat that I'm on there <laughs> there's there's my tent over there <laughs> but it was a concert night so I had company <laughs> uh, I wouldn't put it as number one on your must-see list for national parks but I'm just showing you what's there <laughs> so we'll move on over to oh this is our newest national park New River Gorge I was there last spring and they hadn't even changed the signs yet this this just became a national park last December The area was already protected. Stop me if you've heard this before. It was, it was, under, it was one of the 14 wild and scenic rivers. This is the, the chart that we went through two weeks ago, if you didn't happen to be here. These are the different unit designations. There are actually 423 units under the Park Service protection. So nobody was gonna be damming up the, the new river. It was already protected, but Joe Manchin is from West Virginia. Joe Manchin is coming up for re-election in next year. And you can expect upwards of a 20% bump in tourist dollars spent if you have a national park status, because guys like me will go there when normally I wouldn't. Joe Manchin wanted to have a check in the good column that he brought a national park to West Virginia. We've had four national parks in the last four years. I went through the normal process of creating a national park. There has not been a single word of discussion for any of the last four. They've found an end around. You can introduce legislation in a bill that the president has to sign 
and he doesn't have line item veto. So in 2019, when, when uh, the government had to be reopened and there was an 1100 page omnibus bill, Missouri in, inserted a name change and we ended up with the Gateway Arch National Park. It was part of a national memorial. It was already preserved. So Joe Manchin wants to do the same thing. He, in last December in the military appropriations bill, he put a, a word in there. Anybody been to West Virginia before? They hunt in West Virginia. A lot of gun racks on the, on the pickup trucks. They, they, if not self-reliance, uh, survival hunting, a lot of them serve as guides for out-of-staters. They want to bag a wild boar or a deer or something. There's a lot of hunting that goes on. Well, there are no firearms allowed in a national park. The West Virginians told Joe what he could do with his national park idea because they don't want to stop hunting. Ever the politician, you, you can hunt in a national preserve. There are different rules for different unit designations. So his, his work around is that 90% of the conserved area is now New River Gorge National Preserve, and only 10% right up at the top where the bridge is, is a national park. So it just, it's sad to see the effect that politics is having on our national parks. Uh, doesn't need to be that way. Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest exposed rocks anywhere on the face of the earth. We got to go back 500 million years ago. Pangaea was the supercontinent. That's when all the seven continents were all jammed together. When Africa smashed into the coast of North America, it pushed up the Appalachian Mountains. Appalachian Mountains used to be taller than today's Himalayan mountains. They were over 30,000 feet tall. They're just so darn old, they've been eroded and weathered down to 6,000 feet that we have now, but, but it used to be huge. So you could not more incorrectly name the river than to call it the new river. It's one of the oldest rivers on the face of the planet. <laughs> it, was, it was formed 500 million years ago. So it's had a, a long time to, to gouge out a channel. And it is a pretty, pretty gorge. You walk over from the, the parking area, you get to an overlook spot. Um, the, wa the water here, water always is gonna eventually find its way to the ocean. If you fall on the east side of the Appalachians, you go down to the, the Piedmont, to the lowlands, the swamp country in, in South Carolina and North Carolina. If you fall on the west side, though, you, you, you got a meandering. The Boone, North Carolina is where the New River starts. It's up by Asheville in, on the west side of the Appalachians. Well, it flows north to the Ohio River. The Ohio heads west to the Mississippi and the Mississippi goes all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. You have a 2,000, the water that falls in Boone has a 2,000 mile trip before it finally gets to the ocean. That's the, the journey that the water takes. They do have some cool overlooks, but uh, you gotta have, have done your Stairmaster training there. I counted them, there's 150 steps to get up to the Turkey Spur Overlook. If you're there in the springtime, as I was, you get the uh, rhododendrons are in bloom and it, it's, it's pretty gorgeous. Nice overview. <laughs> 2019, in, inside when it was a more public um, national area, they have the Grand View Theater is there, Cliffside Amphitheater. And it's a summer production, very well attended, very popular. I was there in April of last year and closed for COVID. So I had the place to myself. There are some very cool exposed cliffs in the New River Gorge that have been very, very popular. There's over 1,400 climbing routes. So there's a lot of guide services for training and, and uh, teaching of rock climbings. <clears throat> it's referred to as the new. We're going up to the new this weekend. You want to come? Um, not a lot of elevation change. So that you don't get the, the, the drops of Yosemite or something. The, the, Sandstone, sandstone falls, maybe 10, 12 feet tall. Nothing that's gonna make you forget the 
larger cataracts, but the bridge is very cool. The, the bridge <laughs> opened in 70, I think it was the longest span when it first opened. It's now the fifth longest. It's 1,700 feet, that, that steel arch, 1,700 feet across. You drive right over it, it's Route 19. It's almost 900 feet off the water. It's on the list of historic places. West Virginia didn't have a national park when they had the, the National Park Quarter Series. So the bridge was featured on, on their park, uh, park quarter. It does attract bridge jumpers and they don't like willy nilly people jumping off the bridge. So what they've done is set aside one single day is known as bridge day. It's the third Saturday in October. And if you have the right equipment and you're certified and you, you sign up ahead of time, you're welcome to take a jump. You can, you can leap off. They also, there's a catwalk under the bridge that you can take a tour of. They lower rappelling ropes. It's 876 feet down. So it's a hell of a rappel. You can rappel down if you choose to. They used to also allow bungee jumping. I asked three different rangers why they stopped the bungees in 1993 and nobody either knew or chose to volunteer why. I, I assume the answer wasn't a good one. There must have been some, some accidents. So they don't do bungee jumping anymore, but if you wanna take a flying leap, you're welcome to. It's now the largest outdoor festival anywhere in West Virginia is Bridge Day. There were over 100,000 spectators glommed onto the bridge to watch everybody taking a jump off and hopefully pulling their ripcord and soaring around. So it's a fun day. Great, great vivid. This is the one part of the park that is in fact labeled a national park. That's our newest 63rd National Park. Just over the, the line into Virginia, Western Virginia. If you, if you go due west from Washington, D.C., you get to the top of Shenandoah National Park. Very narrow. It's about 105 miles north to south. Very um, long. It's 100 miles it's maybe a mile or two wide. It's not very long. And actually the Appalachian Trail parallels Skyline Drive. <laughs> it's one of the odd sections of the, normally you, you hike the Appalachian Trail, you're not used to hearing vehicles driving um, or able to stop in and grab a hot dog for lunch. <laughs> you can do that if you're hiking this section of the trail. The whole area was was kind of abused after the Civil War. The, the all the large mammals were hunted to extinction. There was not a lot of game left. Uh, the lumber companies had come in, and these magnificent old growth trees were chopped down for their lumber. If you found a vein of coal or or minerals, it was strip mined. The, the whole area was pretty abused. In the 30s, however. FDR, it's, it's a magnificent view from up on top of the ridge, but the problem was you, the old, you can't get there from here. There was no access point. So FDR set up 10 con civilian conservation corps camps, each with about a thousand workers. <laughs> Give me a road, I want a road here. Well, there's Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel. This, this is pre-pneumatic drills and the, the modern technology to build a, a tunnel. You had to dig it, dig it out. The road, the, the mountain, you had to carve out of the mountain the side of it to, to make a pass for the road. And there weren't too many places where there was enough to bump out and, and make a turnout. Um, this is obviously old, old pictures. There's your first. It's not as though nobody lived there. There were homesteaders that they lived in the area. They did, weren't necessarily in a big hurry to, yeah, sure, take my property for the good of all. Took 11 years of lawsuits, and the Virginians themselves raised the money to settle the lawsuits to buy up all the properties to make the national park. They did, did a good job. This is the first car paying entry going south from the north entrance. Um, the, 
the overlooks are beautiful, but they they're only room for maybe five or six cars there. So if you're driving and you don't worry, because in the hundred mile length of it, there's 75 turnouts. So if, if one's full, just go down. There's there's a one a couple miles down the road that you can can turn out in. Um, very very gorgeous in the fall. The uh, it's like Mother Nature put the quilts right over the the Appalachians. The Skyline Drive goes right along the highest point, so you can look either east or west and and have magnificent views. I live up in New Hampshire, and we think we have pretty good foliage for people to come visit. It's not too shabby down there either. <laughs> you don't have to bring your tent. Uh, there are campgrounds if you want, but there's also lodges you can reserve rooms in. Big Meadows is a is about midpoint. It's in the, the middle of the north to south trek. I, I was there last spring. And it looked like they, they had just, the whole meadow had just burned. So I was talking to a ranger about it. He said, oh, yeah, that's intentional. It's a uh, proposed uh, monitored burn. They use it as a way to control the invasives so that the briar bushes or plants that they don't want, they want it nice and grassy in the meadow. So in the springtime, they just torch the whole thing. And the only thing that grows back is the grasses. There's Iron Mike uh, commemorating the, the camps, the CCC camps that built the Skyline Drive. From Big Meadow, there's a mill prong trail that goes out into the woods to uh, Camp Rapidan. Herbert Hoover was from Missouri. He was an outdoorsman. He was a fisherman. He didn't really care for spending a lot of time in Washington, DC. So he wanted an outdoor retreat. He and his, his wife, Lou Henry, on the footbridge out at Camp Rapidan, which is still there. That was last spring. I'm on the same bridge. Um, this was his getaway. It's, it's one of the best trout streams anywhere in the country to this day. So great fishing. The, in 1930, that was the, the first lady's bedroom <laughs> when she was outside of Washington. It essentially was the precursor to Camp David. It, it gave him an opportunity to take heads of state and get away from the influence of all the, the lobbyists and the peddlers and the hangers on and stuff. And he could invite heads of state out and have a fireside chat one on one with them or go outside. There's a big fireplace. They used to sit around on the big logs and, and have their talks. That's still preserved. Three of the buildings you can are open to the public. Um, where you have rain and you have elevation change, you're going to have falls. They have lots of waterfalls. They're not anything that are going to make you forget the big ones. But if you happen to be there in the summertime, they're nice cooling swim pools, swim holes. Right alongside the Appalachian Trail. And as you drive south, the, you can <coughs> look west, the different overlooks. You can always get a good sunset image. That's Shenandoah National Park. Now our, our Blue Ridge, our parkways we covered a couple of weeks ago normally connect different national parks. Blue Ridge Parkway, when the Skyline Drive ends, you, it transfers into the Blue Ridge Parkway. So it's Shenandoah at the north. And if you drive the length of it, you end up at Great Smoky Mountains. It's a beautiful drive if it doesn't happen to be raining. When it rains, it's. I had the wipers on as fast as they would go, and I couldn't see a thing. I had to pull over. It's very torrential up in North Carolina mountains. The Great Smokies, Great Smoky Mountains, we could easily spend the next hour on. It's a very cool park. I put the map up there with the roads to show you why this is, if you remember from last time, this is our most visited national park of all the parks. Two to one over the runner-up. I think Great, um, Grand Canyon has about 5.1 million, over 10 million in Great Smoky Mountains. It's more a function of accessibility. If you drew a 150 or 200 mile radius around Great Smoky Mountain, 
there's so many interstates that allow people access to it. It's just popular. So the map of the, the park itself, the Appalachian Trail follows the Tennessee, North Carolina border that bisects the park. So it's, it's kind of a fun, if you read Bill Bryson's Walk in the Woods, you'll, he has fun with it with one foot in Tennessee and one foot in North Carolina and all kinds of, uh, there, there is a uh, 441 there is a road that bisects north to south that goes over Newfound Gap. So you can drive from good old Gatlinburg. <laughs> if, you, if, you think, if you think the Vegas Strip is hokey, you ought to, you ought to go visit Gatlinburg sometime. Wow. Uh, and then, then there's a spur that goes up to Klingman's Dome. Klingman at 6,600 feet is the highest east of the, the Rockies, east of South Dakota, actually. The smoke in Great Smoky Mountains is actually fog, and it's the exhalation of, of the plants that settle down in these, these ridges and stuff. Um, we went over the formation of the Appalachians. What happened, glaciers don't move very fast. Well, I'll get to them in a minute. Timeline for the park. Um, you had Jamestown, um, Colonial Williamsburg along the, the early settlements on the coast. They wanted to go west. West to them is Western North Carolina. <laughs> so they wanted to move out there, but. The problem was the Cherokee Indian nation already was there. That's another time. fodder for another discussion is the Trail of Tears. The government said, no, no problem. We'll take care of that. We got a nice dust bowl over in Oklahoma that we can relocate the Cherokees to. So that was the, the Trail of Tears where they moved them out. So then the, the lumber company says, awesome. I'll buy 9,000 acres of that old growth timber and over the next 20 years continued to clear cut all of the lumber. So you had homesteaders that had come and set up shop. These were their land. You had the industries, the, the mineral rights, the lumber industries. You had conservationists saying, no, no, save it for future generations, all pitted against each other. 6,000 individually owned parcels inside the borders of, of what the current borders of the park are. Who rode in on his white horse? John Jr. $5 million is a lot of money today. In 1934, during the depression, $5 million was an awful lot of money. He donated $5 million to settle all these lawsuits and buy up the lands and give us Smoky Mountains, Great Smoky Mountains National. So now you've got 800 miles of trails of this pristine forest land. <laughs> when I, what I was mentioning about the glaciers is glaciers don't move very fast. During the last ice age, when they were coming down through Canada, down into Ohio and, and Pennsylvania, the plants have time to send their spores or their seeds down ahead of the advancing, they only move a foot or so a year, um, but over a gazillion years, they cover some ground. The plants kept being forced south and south and south. They found this fertile soil with lots of rain and rich soil. They loved it in the hills there. Well, the glaciers stopped advancing and they went back up to Canada. Now you have this collection of plant life. I, I have a uh, separate presentation that I do with garden clubs and it's just called Plants in the Parks. At the end of which I have the bronze, silver and gold medal winners of the parks. Spoiler alert, <laughs> Great Smoky Mountains is the gold medal winner. You know, you have the laminated guides, the birds of the backyard birds or shells or something. There's flowering plants that maybe has seven or eight on a, on a page. There are over 1,500 flowering plants, not species of plants, 1,500 flowering plants in Great Smoky Mountain National Park. <laughs> and, and when you come across it, it's not like, oh, I found the azalea. It's a mountainside of az azaleas. There's the rhododendrons are another mountainside. It's unbelievable. From mid-April to the end of May, 
good luck trying to find a, a room in Gatlinburg. As many hotels as they have, it is like Mecca for plant people to, to go down there. It, it's absolutely astounding. And trees, those, those are the flowering plants. There are more species of trees inside Great Smoky Mountains National Park than of all the forests of Europe combined. So it's it's really a tree hugger's par paradise. It's it's pretty uh, noteworthy. If you're a plant person, you you really owe it to yourself to to go visit. Appalachian Trail, as I mentioned, runs through. There's 70 miles of it uh, from the southwest to the northeast. Uh, they do have the erosion bars put in so that when it rains, it doesn't wash out the the trail. Uh, there are campsites but they've taken to advance reservations. You need, you can upwards of a year in advance, you can reserve campsites. So you pretty much have to know you're going impromptu isn't the, the word in today's national parks. Um, but if you're gonna camp there, you have to share because there's critters out there. A lot of black bears, I saw several, um, my last visit to, to Great Smoky Mountains and they, they're not, looking for confrontation. They're ripping apart rotted logs for the bugs and stuff, but they're there. They don't have, in the campsites, they don't have the, the metal uh, food bear-proof boxes that you'll get out in the Sierra Nevadas, uh, but they do have this pulley system so that you can take your food pack and hopefully get it up where the bears, bears can't reach. Um, one of the more unique phenomena that you'll, you'll be able to see is, or Fireflies, lightning bugs. Um, there are 19 different species in the park. Poor guys, they, they, it takes them two years to mature and then they can light up and buzz around for two weeks and then they die. But the last, either the end of May, the first week in June, I, I have no idea why, what the attraction is, but literally tens of thousands of these bugs descend on Smoky Mountain National Park. It's gotten so popular. It's very predictable. It happens every year. It's gotten so popular that I think it's in February is the lottery. If you want to go there, you have to get a ticket to gain entrance to the park in February for the one particular day that you're going to be there. There's only one other place anywhere on the planet that this occurs. It's over in Southeast Asia and Malaysia that, that they gather like this. Hundreds of thousands of fireflies, they just light up the woods. It's, it's really a unique scenario. So if you're out there and you find a clearing in the woods, the, the forest is lit up with bugs. If you get a clear day, you've got stars up above. You, you can. You don't even need your drugs. Uh, you, you can just have a hell of an experience <laughs> sitting there with your headlamp. Another another uh, noteworthy. <laughs> this is known as the salamander capital of the world. Um, if that's your thing, they have little pygmy salamanders, thirty different species of because everything's moist and you turn over logs or, or rocks and you're going to find salamanders under them. Uh, they have one called the Hellbender that is, if you're going to pick up a four, four pound salamander, you have to use a cloth. They breathe through their skin and you have oils in your, um, ooh, we're at a, an hour already. You have oils in your skin, it clogs their pores and the poor guys can't breathe. So if you're so inclined to pick up salamander, four pounder, you use a rag. 40 waterfalls in the park. Um, again, they're very, 10 million people, they don't all come in January and February. So you, you go in the summer, you're gonna have company, but the, the swimming holes are popular. Gotta be the most bizarre site I've, in any national park, I've, <laughs> I've been to all of them. If you read Bryson's Walk in the Woods, he talks about the grassy balds in the Appalachians. Most of the mountains south of there, Georgia and South Carolina, you, your reward for climbing to the top is that there are grass meadows on, on the top and you get a heck of a view. Well, Clingman's Dome is the top, is the highest. 
the park rangers were getting so many complaints from people climbing to the high point that the damn trees are in the way. They didn't have a view. So what did the, what did the park service do? They built a 54 foot tall observation handicap accessible ramp to get you up above the trees so that you can have your photo op. At the, it looks like it came out of the, like Martians dropped it out of the sky. Takes all, all types. Um, so you got 16 mountains over 6,000 feet. That's what's left of them. These are not Photoshop. These are actual pictures that, again, you can't take a bad picture. The fog settles down in the, in the valleys at sunset and stuff. Beautiful. I've been told to speed things up. Feel free if you're, if, I think we're at an hour long. If I'm not thin skinned, if you have to leave, you have to leave. <laughs> Uh, the question was how many times I've been to Great Smokies three times. Most of them I make return trips to. It's the beauty of having that as your hobby. Congaree, I'll go through quickly. A lot of people don't even know there's a national park in South South Carolina. It's uh, <laughs> it's one of the ones that got promoted from that. It used to be Congaree Swamp National Monument. When they upgraded it to a national park, the marketing department wisely chose to drop the swamp part. Um, it was named after the Indian tribe, the, the Native Americans that used to live there, the Congaree tribe. Unfortunately, the Europeans arrived with their smallpox, the Indians had no defense, and there are no more Congaree Indians anymore. Swamp actually was not a, a true moniker. The southern border is the Congaree River and the Cedar Creek runs through the middle of it. So it's not stationary water. You know the, the Nile River in, in Egypt where it overflows its banks and makes for the Fertile Crescent where it's great growing area? Same thing here, when it rains in the Appalachians, the stuff on the east side comes down, floods the lowlands, but it does it 10 times a year. So the lumber companies wanted to get at the entire area's old growth forests. They wanted those trees, they tried, but they were losing so many pieces of equipment to the swamp because it kept miring in the, in the, in the mud. They said the heck with that and they worked around it. So now you've got this island of old growth trees there. <laughs> the growing conditions are absolute perfection. It's the tallest, temperate hardwood forest anywhere in the world. Um, the canopy in Congaree is taller than that of the Amazon rainforest. They just, the trees love it there. It's <laughs> the champion trees, in addition to having a lot of different species, it's a different climate zone than we have in New England. So the species are different, but boy, do they like it there. 25 South Carolinian champion trees, six of which are national champions until Hugo landed. The champion tree program takes three measurements into account. If there's a maple tree outside, you can go 48 inches from the ground and measure the circumference of the tree. That gives you a numerical value for that tree. Then you measure ground to the top of the tree, the height gives you another number, and then the crown spread from side to side, how wide is it? You add those three numbers together and you get a numerical value for the maple tree outside. Well, somewhere in Massachusetts, those three numbers, there's a tree where those three numbers added together are the highest total. That's the Massachusetts maple, red maple champion. But Vermont has red maples and New Hampshire has red, somewhere, there's a single national champion of that species. In Congaree, here's your champions list. 25 of them, Congaree is not that big a, a, a park area wise. 25 South Carolinian champions and the double stars are national champions. That was before Hugo hit in 1989. They're, they're up so high the hurricane snapped off five of the six national champion trees. Um, so they're different, they're, they're tupelos, they're water hickories, they're persimmon trees, they're different than we have here. But there's your, there's your national champion bald cypress tree. 
it's 26 feet in circumference around the tree. <laughs> so you can go on a ranger, a big tree ranger tour that takes in the monsters. It's kind of fun. Cypress. Cypress trees have an extension of their root system called cypress knees that, that grow up. They look like little leprechauns off in the, in the distance in the woods. It's kind of scary. So there's your national champion, sweet gum tree. You know, we just don't have pine trees of that kind of girth around here. It's, it's another tree hugger paradise. If you're, if you're down in Charleston, it's 90 minutes up the road. Go, go put in an afternoon. There's a... <laughs> I was there about six weeks ago. Um, they give you a warning that it, it, there are bugs. <laughs> it's a swamp. Um, so they tell you how bad it is. Serious uh, project somebody undertook two and a half mile boardwalk, half of which is elevated to keep you out of the water. The other half is down at, at ground level. It gives you a, an easy walk to go out into the, into the park. You do want to pay attention if you're going off the boardwalk out into the, the wilds. They do a good job at the visitor center of showing you the, the berries that are nutritious and, and juicy and the ones that are going to give you a bellyache. Same with the critters. This happens to be a harmless brown snake, but they're virtually identical to the poisonous water moccasins. You got you're, you're down in the south. There are gators. There are you want to you want to have your wits about you if you're gonna if you're gonna go far afield. Even the darn spiders are, are like eight inch across spiders. <laughs> you don't have to hike. You can take a, a kayak ride down the Cedar Creek. There's a ranger led tour that'll you can paddle for an afternoon. Different ways. Can't really get a sunset shot in in the in the woods. Um, there's the trail. So that's the end of Congaree. Sure, quick question. The question is, do you see gators kayaking? Absolutely. They, they're usually stationary. They, they just, they're kind of lazy. They, they don't swim around all that much. They're usually, you got to pick them out from a log because they just sit there still. But, oh yeah, you see them. Brings us down to Florida, two, two parks. Um, Homestead's a great base of operations, if you want. It's five miles east to the visitor center at Biscayne and five miles west to the visitor center at Everglades. So it's just south of Miami. Biscayne, 97% of the park is underwater. <laughs> so there's not a lot of visitors there that don't bring a mask and snorkel or, or scuba and stuff. It's actually four very, very different, distinct ecosystems. The narrow green strip on the left along the coast is a mangrove forest that borders the protected bay, Biscayne Bay, which is basically seagrass. Then you have the northernmost of the Florida Keys that are the Coral Islands, Boca Chita is the, the northernmost there. And then outside the, the Keys is the only living coral reef in the US. So you have one, two, three, four different systems. Mangroves, we spend a lot of time on. We owe, we owe a, you hear about the hurricanes and the 12 foot or 15 foot storm surge that gets pushed ashore. Elevation in Florida is measured in inches. A 12 foot saltwater surge is going to decimate, it would go right across the panhand or the, the peninsula. But for the, tropical mangroves that grow there. They, that's our protective barrier that saves the inland. They filter the clean, fresh water coming down from the uh, flowing Everglades, mixing with the salt water. They, they anchor the silt so it doesn't all wash away. They provide nesting areas. Mangrove forests are awesome. Make it a little tough kayaking to, to get up the canals and stuff, but that's what they're like. We'll get to the birds in a, in a minute when we get to Everglades, but the, the, the long-legged ones, the herons, the storks, the egrets, when it's low tide, they have their, their pick walking around out there. You can fish from shore, you can take kayaks and boats and go out 
into the bay. The bay is protected by the island, so it's very quiet. And it's not very deep. You don't really need to scuba there. You can just snorkel around. And there's there's a whole bunch of different creatures that that reside in the bay, including nature's lawnmowers, the <laughs> the manatees. Every adult manatee will consume over 100 pounds of aquatic vegetation on a daily basis. So they they're like Pac-Man. They just go along and they they basically mow the the seagrass and keep it manageable. <laughs> There's all kinds of them out there. Okachita is the northernmost key. It's only 16 miles to South Beach in Miami ac across the bay there. So it's not, it's not very far away from civilization. Elliott Key is the bigger one. That's where there's a campground. It's only three feet above sea level. So you, with, without the protection, you don't want to have your camp set up here. This is where... Uh, Hurricane Andrew first made sure <laughs> you don't want your tent. It wouldn't be there when you came back if the uh, storm surge hit. But not a lot of people go there. So if you want a Florida beach and want to have it to yourself, take, take the shuttle out to the key. I'm a certified scuba diver. I, I don't like coming back up for air all the time. So it's kind of fun to be able to go down and stay down. There are over 500 species of reef fish down there. Quick coral lesson. There's five conditions. It's the only actively growing coral reef in the US. You need five conditions for coral to be growing. Number one, they, they don't grow very deep. They, they need the sunlight for photosynthesis. So you won't find coral under 35, 40 feet deep. So they, the sunlight filters out. You need clear water. If there's a, a river that empties in that's got silt and suspended sediments, that would block the sunlight. So it needs clear water. Um, you don't see it up coral off the coast of Maine. They like 70 to 80 degrees is their sweet spot for growing. You don't find coral in fresh water. It's got to be salt. And they need clean. Can't have runoff from agricultural or the... Uh, golf courses or something, the chemicals, that would encourage algae blooms and the algae would coat the, the little guys. If you have all five conditions, you get corals. And these guys grow and you have an active, healthy reef. <laughs> the species of reef fish, I can show you a lot of magnificent pictures of underwater coral reefs. You know what colorful fish look like. Everything's magnified underwater. I guess you can have the clear ones now. The, the dive mask used to curtail your peripheral vision. So how would, you, how would you like to turn your head to the side and see this guy looking at you? It's a 500. They don't even have teeth. They're not dangerous, but they're large <laughs> and they're wild. It's a goliath fish. There are some shipwrecks that you can dive around on because it's relatively shallow. Not everybody looked at their charts. You do have sharks in the same waters. So there's Boca Chita sunset looking up towards Miami from there, or looking west from Elliott Key across the quiet bay toward the west, the sunset. And our last park is Everglades. There's my three sons. My wife doesn't care for that moniker. I said, well, Fred McMurray didn't star in Our Three Sons. That's the name of it. <laughs> so they got, they got to some pretty good trips. The Everglades, Florida gets about 60 inches of rain a year. And it's essentially a basin. It's, it's bowed higher on the, on the coasts. And it's tilted towards the south a little bit. Not, not a lot. It doesn't flow. But Lake Okeechobee is the collection point for most of the rain. And then it flows down this corridor. I mentioned national preserves extend the boundaries of a national park. They created Big Cypress National Preserve so that the condos and golf courses didn't siphon off the, the moving river. But even, even at that, the Everglades National Park only represents about one seventh of the whole corridor, which are the Everglades. 
the park itself is bordered on three sides by salt water. It's a couple different visitor centers that you can get into the park. The, the cypress trees are, are unique. It's a deciduous tree, but they don't seem to have a problem with their roots being submerged in, in water all the time. They grow, so they line the, the canals and stuff. You'll see cypress down there. It was actually the birds that led to us having Everglades National Park. The 1880s, 1890s, the haberdasheries got so taken with their fashion, high, high oak fashion, either in Paris or New York or Philly, they were getting so much money for the egret plumes and the, and the wild species that it got to the point where it was worth the risk to go out and murder the game wardens whose job it was to protect the poachers and stuff. The poachers would kill the game wardens because the rewards of the, of the plumage was such that it was worth their while. They were hunted almost to extinction, and it was the Audubon Society that stepped in and said, wait a minute, you know, you're, you're eradicating these magnificent species. And they were the one that pushed for the conservation for this, the park to be set up. So it was initially set up as a state park. Um, it was authorized as a national park in 1934, but in 1934, the government didn't have any money. So it wasn't until 13 years later that the park actually opened. But during that time, once it got national park authorization, they could post federal employees there. So it put an end to the, the poaching. So hats off to the Audubon Society. They were the one that, it's, it's actually the first park designated to preserve an ecosystem rather than a wonder of nature, like Zion, Red Rocks, or the Grand Canyon or something. Most of the parks are, are to preserve a, a natural wonder. This was to save the entire ecosystem. Mangrove, the largest mangrove system anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. The, the crocs are not usually solitary. Where there's one, there's usually many. <laughs> um, there's bunches of them. Sawgrass Prairie, it, it's not very deep. It's maybe knee deep, thigh deep. You could, you could walk around out there. Not sure you'd want to. There's, there's, you'd have reptile company, but what it does is allow for these mag greatly engineered boats, these fan boats. They don't have a keel. They don't have a, a motor, a propeller underneath. They're pushed forward by the fan, so they they only draw like three or four inches. They can skim across, so they can go across these prairies pretty much anywhere, skimming over the grass. And it allows you to get out where the big flocks are, the spoonbills or the, the pink flamingos and stuff by the thousands that there's no boardwalk or anything that would get you out there. You can take a, a fan boat ride and, and see a, quite a bit of the park. 300 different species of birds. There are also 14 endangered species that this ecosystem's correct. Uh, and serve. Three of them are, are turtles. You got the Florida panther. We have a we have a crocodile, an American crocodile that lives in the same areas as the, they're not as populous as the gators, but they share the, the same areas. And our poor manatees, these guys, they're not very mobile. So when something comes in, like a, a the red tide is an algae bloom, in 2013, almost 800 manatees got killed just because the algae bloomed all around them. There's your aerial view of the, the slowly meandering river of water coming down from the north. This is a real problem. Some Einstein decided that they were going to give their pet a nice new home and turn them loose in this great environment for the python. Burma is not North America. They don't have any natural predators. Nobody in the Everglades, no critters, feed on Burmese Southeast Asia pythons. The female lays up to 100 eggs every time they nest. There are pythons all over the place. They're pop and, they're, and they don't have any natural predators. 
they came to the attention of the scientists because of the dramatic drop off in small mammal population. Well, duh, where are they going to go? They're, they're all at, at ground level, but either the nesting eggs for the birds are accessible to the pythons, the small mammals, there's, there's no trees that they can climb up, it's just all open, so the pythons are going crazy. That's a big snake. They've, they've taken to offering uh, bounty, these are bounty hunters, to bring in the, the pythons. I mean, they're, they're getting out of control. They're, they're just, it's a bad problem. And if you don't mind them dropping down out of the trees into your boat, you can you can paddle up the, <laughs> the mangrove forest. There's different ways to see the park. There are boardwalks you can get out into the Everglades. Um, you can canoe down the con different canals and stuff. It is bordered, as I mentioned, on three sides by saltwater, and not a lot of people do that. But you can take sea kayaks and go around the bays. You don't need a backcountry. You just pull up on the shore where there's nobody else, and you can set up your tent and. Have, have the place to yourself. It's a great, if, if you're camping, it's a good way to experience the park. And no shortage, it depends on where you are in the park as to what you're gonna get for a sunset. These are the pine uh, prairie across the open water. This is the, the mangrove forests. Um, you can go out in the sawgrass prairies. There's, there's just no end to the different views. So that's our, the end of our Maine to Georgia, or Maine to Florida, sorry, thinking of the Appalachian Trail. Um, start of our tour to all the parks. Back in two weeks, we're gonna be out west. We'll do the Sierra Nevadas and cover Yosemite and Sequoia and Kings Canyon and stuff. All right, but thank you very much. I don't know if Joe's monitoring this, whether we have any questions typed in the chat room from the from the live audience, the Zoom audience. Don't know. Yep. Did you? Have... Um, I have not been to the Everglades recently. Um, that's been almost 10 years now since since I've been there. No, I she she the question was, did you? Did you go handle the pythons? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I leave that to the bounty people. Oh, it's been, it, it, the question is how long have the pythons been a problem? Um, it, it's been maybe 20 years they've been growing. They've been there for a while and they're pretty comfortably ensconced. It's, it's gonna be tough to eradicate them. They don't belong there. They're an invasive species, but try, try getting them out. They kind of like it there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting kudos. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, I didn't bring it up. I have a uh, collage down in the in the car with me with the entrance signs to the parks that my kids had been to before they got. They're in their 30s now, so they're right. married and off on their own. But the ones that we took them to, it takes a, a, a three foot poster size frame to with all the entrance signs to the parks that they saw. That if you if you remember the the slide that showed the 423 units under the Park Service, one of the line items, the the unit designations is National Seashores. There's National Seashores from Point Reyes on on the left coast to the Gulf Coast and all the way up the east. That's under the Park Service, but it's not a national park. It's a, it's a National Seashores. There's like a dozen of them um, all along the outer. And then there's National Lake Shores in the Great Lakes and stuff. Very, very interesting. Great. Thank you.